In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, as we uh, face the delicious prospect of being able to partake at the banquet of your word today, once again, we thank you and we, we ask you to give us the spiritual ability to be open in our minds and our hearts to the goodness that you have here for us and help us to accept it with joy and to eagerly implement the graces that you give us into our lives so that we can live a life of faith, hope, and love more faithfully. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. I feel deja vu because the last time we did the book of Acts in 2003 it was in this room and I was standing right here. Larry? Yeah, I'll, I'll make you some copies of that. All right, so this is what I want to say. Um, we've already, we're already a couple of chapters into it, and what I want to describe has already been there, even though we haven't highlighted it too much. I don't want you to look at this study as simply... We have some more chairs. There's a couple over here. I don't want you to look at this as simply a study of history of other people in other times. Okay? I would really like us to make a personal connection with what we're reading. And the best analogy I could think of driving in this morning is if you went to, well I did this one time, in Italy I, I, I was told I had long lost relatives in Natuno. And so I went to Natuno. I didn't know these people, didn't know, I'd never met them, never really thought of them very much. But it seemed like a good thing to do since I was in the neighborhood. And I walk in and there's a picture of my grandfather as a child on the wall. And there's a picture of him and his sister, who I never met, Zephra, as children there. And I realized they're family, you know. Yeah. Indeed. They are family. And I started thinking, also I get that feeling, because I, I recognize that feeling. If you go to a church in Nigeria or, or, or France or Italy or wherever, you walk into this Catholic church, you see an altar, you see a tabernacle, everywhere, all of them. Whether it's a little mission somewhere out in the country or a big basilica somewhere. You see an altar, you see a tabernacle, you see a red candle letting you know that the, the Blessed Sacrament is there. You see a crucifix for sure. Somewhere close by but not quite in a position of prominence, you'll see a statue or a portrait of the Blessed Mother. Hmm. They may have, if they're fortunate enough, some stained glass windows or other statues of saints you know. Maybe St. Joseph for sure. Maybe St. Francis. Others, maybe some that you didn't know, that you're just being introduced to. But you realize, I'm home. Yeah. Right? And this, I'm welcome here. All right. So I say that because, as I've mentioned before, the master idea of church, and that's called ecclesiology, the understanding of what you think church is. The master idea in Catholic ecclesiology is that it is the family of God. All right? And that everywhere you go, if there's a Catholic church in the congregation, they are your family. All right? All, all churches, all, all Christian churches do not have that understanding. Okay? We would have what uh, the people that study this kind of thing call a high ecclesiology, which means we put great importance on what church is and its place in God's plan of salvation. We would say things that some would consider quite outlandish and outrageous, like the church is divine. Not because we think the priests and uh, popes and bishops are all perfectly holy. No, no, no. We would say because it is an, a living organism connected with Jesus Christ. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, why are you persecuting me? Paul says, the church is the body of Christ. So because of that connection, wrinkles and all, we would say the church is divine and inspired, motivated and energized by the Holy Spirit, by God. Okay? We would also say things like the church, by God's design, is hierarchical. That there are God-given leaders that have authority in areas to define and settle matters of doctrine. Even legislative authority. Okay? We would say there's a very, def well, I mean, so that if the leaders of our church said electionary, 
that all Catholics in the world will read these scriptures on these days. We actually believe that's binding. That when they set seasons and dates for holy days, when they define disputed doctrine, we believe that's binding. Okay? We believe we have a very defined sacramental system. Because we dare to believe that Jesus established a church, yes, to go and preach the gospel to all people. But also because he wanted a church that would administer these sacraments for his people for all times. Because the sacraments are sure ways for us to receive grace. The power of God to be able to live successfully as Christians in this life. Because a lot of the things that we face are too big for us. We won't succeed otherwise without the supernatural help of Almighty God. That evil and sin and temptation and disappointments are too much for us, no matter how virtuous and heroic we are. That we absolutely need the ongoing help, not just to become a Christian, but to successfully live as a Christian. And that God knew that. Therefore, Jesus established these sacraments and a church to make sure that they were available to his people. Now, other groups would dispute all of that and more that I could say. The, the Greek Orthodox are probably pretty close to what we call this high church idea. The Anglicans, slightly less important. Then you get Episcopalians and some Methodists. And when I say on down, I'm not, I don't mean to denigrate that. I don't mean it's, it's less worthy. But they have a lower opinion of the importance of church in God's plan. And, and at the other end of the spectrum, you have totally independent groups, fundamentalist groups. I don't need church at all. In fact, our goal is to have as little organized church as possible. It might be a necessary evil. Because once you get people involved, then you lose the spirit. You, 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 you have the traditions of men being imposed on the pure message of the gospel. Joel Olstein, I heard say, I don't have any theology. I don't have any doctrine. I just have the word of God. Well, the, the problem we would say is that there's a lot of theology and doctrine in the Word of God, all right? right? So it, it, it's one of those arguments that kind of has a collision course with itself if you, if you start dissecting it at all. Uh, for instance, the Scripture says itself, in I think 2 Timothy 3.15, the pillar and foundation of the truth is the church. The Word of God says... The pillar and foundation of truth is, you'd expect it to say, but it says the church. Okay? Alright, so we're, we're in Acts now. And what I, want, well, I say all that because I want you to see the seed form of the church as we know it emerging now. This, this criticism that you Catholics invented all this church stuff that you have now, this Pope and these bishops and these sacraments and these liturgies, somewhere in the Middle Ages, and it was all a power grab against superstitious people to be able to control them, claiming to have spiritual authority. That's the antagonist of the Catholic Church would say that, okay? But what have we seen so far? We've seen that Jesus established this church. Holy Spirit given to all the disciples, but built on the foundation of 12 designated <coughs> leaders, haven't we? With Peter as obviously the leader of that group. We've seen an empty chair, and they have replaced him. Peter said we need to replace him. Everybody said, whoa, 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 that's just your opinion, man. <laughs> I mean, we really don't need any of you apostles. I've got the Holy Spirit now, right? I can figure this out for myself, so you just take your little man-made ideas and get out of here. No, he said we need to replace him, and they did, and they had, and, he, and his decision was binding. And then they made a decision on who it was, and that's who it was. All right? We had before, even before Jesus' death, him breathing on the apostles, said, receive the Holy Spirit. Those sins you forgive will be forgiven. Those sins you retain will be retained. Is this not the seed form of a sacrament? At the Last Supper, this is my body, this is my blood. Take and eat. Now go and do this in remembrance of me. And here in Acts, we've already seen that the first thing they do, this, organ, this church, as they get new believers, is meet on the first day of the week on Sunday and celebrate the breaking of the bread. Do we not have here a sacramental seed? All right. 
in two chapters, we're going to see the apostles deciding they needed to expand their authority. They need helpers. So they're going to pick, they said, we want some deacons. Nominate some people out of your group. They accepted them and they made them deacons by laying hands on them. And the Holy Spirit came into this group of men, not to be apostles, but to exercise their own order in the church by the laying on of hands. Is this not ordination? Is this not ordination? I, I'm trying to... I, Jesus said at the ascension, go into all the world now. Teach them what I taught you and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, Peter comes out now filled with the Holy Spirit. He preaches to this group and said, listen, all this commotion that you see is because the Holy Spirit, the promise, has been given to us. The promise is in our scriptures. It's come because the Messiah has come. It is Jesus Christ whom you crucified, but who God raised from the dead. We saw him. We are witnesses to this. He is the Messiah, and a time of judgment is coming. And where you're going to be in it, how you're going to be judged, is going to be based on whether you accept or reject this Jesus as the Messiah. And they're cut to the quick. And they say, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, look, I'm all for accepting Jesus as your, as is Jake speaking, I'm all for accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. <clears throat> Believe it in your heart, in your mind, and profess it with your mouth. But when they said, what do I need to be saved? What was his answer? Repent and be baptized. Be baptized. Do we not have a sacrament that they accept has been instituted by Christ and now their responsibility is in the name of Christ to make and administer that sacrament to God's people. So the graces of it will be available to them. They said, what do we have to do to be saved? And he said, well, I'm having an altar call. <laughs> Come on up, you know, raise your hand and repeat after me. I have nothing against that. But that's not what his answer was. The word of God says, the answer to what must I do to be saved was repent and be baptized. Are you getting it? We're two chapters into this already. There's going to be more. We're going to have these apostles designating emissaries to take messages to, uh, to churches and other places in the Roman Empire and to say things they expect them to be bound to. They're not going to say, go tell your Pope we're fine. We don't need that stuff. I mean, we've got the Holy Spirit. We've got our elders. We've got our own preacher. And as long as I agree with everything he says, I'm going to stay here. Right. <laughs> If he doesn't, I'll go off and find someone who does, or I'll start another church. That's not the way it was working, right? They would get emissaries from the recognized leaders, and it would be binding. They would designate Barnabas and others to go get a report and come back to us, and Barnabas would do it. In a chapter, we'll probably get to today, Ananias and Zephira, I don't know if you've ever wished you could make it into the Bible, but you wouldn't want to do it this way. <laughs> Ananias and Zephira, his wife, tell a lie before Peter. And he says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And they drop dead. Separately, on the same day. But he didn't say, I mean, how bodacious this man saying, you just lied to the Holy Spirit. Who does he think he is? And then to prove that what he said was probably true, the Holy Spirit, not Peter, struck them dead. Probably a very sound lesson to the community. <laughs> right? Don't you think that action uh, was confirming to those watching that the it would impress the pudding out of me. <laughs> I'd have thought twice about everything I said to Peter from there. No, I wouldn't say anything to him, right? <laughs> no, I wouldn't lie to him. And, and by the way, we're going to see they, their sin was not greed because what they're going to lie about is whether they had turned over all the money. They sold their land and possessions, which I don't think it was required. But a lot of, most of them were doing it. And it's going to be juxtaposed with Barnabas, who very generously gave everything. And then these two come up and they give some money. And Peter says, is this everything? And he says, yep. <laughs> and he says, really? Yep. Boom. 
right? And then his wife comes in and said, you know that bag that they're carrying out right now? That's your husband. Was this all the money? Yep. Boom. Boom. <laughs> so their sin was lying, but Peter says, not to me, but to the Holy Spirit, which means he felt like he represented God in his office. Now, I am glad the gospel has been so brutally honest with telling us what Peter was like in his humanity. I mean, he's uneducated, rough, impetuous, weak. He failed. So obviously, this charism that he has is not because he's such a charismatic person, right? Or all that educated. In, we're going to read now in this next chapter how he's going to so impress the Sanhedrin and shut them down that they're going to let him go. I want you to keep in mind, this is the same Sanhedrin that about two months ago, Jesus stood before. Right? They killed him. Crucified him. And yet Peter and John dragging in say, okay, I guess we're next. Warm up a couple more crosses, right? But they stood up with all the authority and the confidence that they felt from, the, from what God had given them. And he gave a, a, his, his speech again. Because he... They arrested him because he gave that Pentecost speech again in the portico of Solomon and converted a couple thousand more. And they drug him in and they said, you, know, you got to stop doing this, right? It'll tell us that they're, they're arrested because of jealousy. Because you have these educated priests and Pharisees thinking, how come nobody's coming to my service? You got five, this fisherman's got 5,000 people out there. He, he didn't even go to high school as far as we know. I've got a PhD from, you know, and all this stuff. It says, I'm the one they should be coming to, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to him. It says, out of jealousy. They arrest him and say, whose name are you doing this? And so Jesus, and Peter gives the speech again. And they are so shut down with not knowing how to answer it. They tell him, well, okay. Leave, but don't do it anymore. <laughs> That's all they got. They'll be arrested again here in a couple of chapters and they'll go it'll be almost the same thing. All right, so, all right. Anyway, what was my point? I, I want you, I want as we read this, for you to have the eyes and the openness to see our church, not arising from superstitious, uh, power-grabbing decisions of small-minded men in the Middle Ages, but that we are the natural growth and blossoming of practices that existed from day one of the birth of the church. Okay? Mm -hmm. According to the will of God. According to the word of God. According to the word of God. The Bible is describing this. We're not putting a, a, a tension between the church and the Bible. The church is the body of Christ described in the Bible. The Bible came out of the teaching of the church. Okay? We don't put a division in there. Somebody have a hand up? Yeah, I did. Just to underscore what you were saying, that's where we left off last week was on the communal life in the church. And we'll pick up at chapter three, verse one, right? Uh, well, we finished. Uh, no, we finished on chapter two. Okay. Uh, but we are going to start with chapter three, verse one. All right. So the chapter two, uh, verse forty-two, they yeah. devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayer. All came upon everyone and made wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Right. This is where it said that in this community at least, all who shared the faith owned everything in common. They sold their goods and possessions and distributed the proceeds among themselves according to what each one needed. I think I mentioned that we don't have that praxis being described in any other church, not in Antioch, in Ephesus, or Corinth. Or, they didn't really do that everywhere else, but they did it here. My hypothesis and others is that because they knew that Pretty soon, maybe tomorrow, they were going to have to leave. When they saw the abomination of desolation, definitely when they saw the armies surrounding Jerusalem, the time of judgment was here. They didn't know when it was going to be, within a generation, 40 years, but it could be tomorrow. And so they liquidated their assets because when that happened was not going to be a time to decide to sell their vineyard. Right? So they were liquidating their assets 
so that when the time came, they could up and skedaddle uh, quickly. And they had made provisions of where they were going to go. Now they had a way to pay for it and take care of everybody. So, I mean, it just seemed like a very practical decision. It doesn't say that it was necessarily binding, but that's what they thought was good practice and good thing to do, and that's obviously what they were doing in large numbers. And it says, each day with one heart they regularly went to the temple. They're still Jews. Absolutely they're Jews. We're thinking, as Christians, we found the Messiah that the Jews have been prophesying and looking for for all these centuries. Our job now is to convince everyone else he's here. Judaism is not bogus. It's been fulfilled. All the prophecies are true. It's in Jesus Christ. So they went to the temple still on Saturdays, but met in their houses for the breaking of the bread on Sundays. And they shared their food gladly and generously and praised God. And day by day the Lord added to their community those destined to be saved. All right, chapter 3. Once when Peter and John were going up to the temple for prayers, which they did every day, at the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m., the day ended at 6 p.m., so this would be a rather late hour in the day. So they would go to the temple and they would have evening prayers, right, before the day was over. And they were good Jews and they were going up there to do their prayers. And it happened that there was a man being carried along. He was a cripple from birth. And they used to put him down every day near the temple entrance called the Beautiful Gate. We don't exactly know which gate that is. Probably the Eastern Gate. Uh, anyway, so that he could beg from the people going in. When this man saw Peter and John on their way to the temple, he begged for, from them. He wanted some money. Peter and John, too, looked straight at him and said, look at us. He turned to them expectantly, hoping to get something from them. But Peter said, I have neither silver nor gold, but I will give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. Then he took him by the right hand and helped him to stand up. And instantly his feet and ankles became firm. He jumped up, stood, and began to walk. And he went in with them into the temple, walking and jumping and praising God. All kinds of prophetic significance in that. Everyone could see him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the man who used to sit begging at the beautiful gate of the temple. They all knew him. He'd been there for years and years and years and years. Lame from birth, and they were all astonished and perplexed. We have the first miracle. We now have... The ministry of Jesus Christ continuing through his church. And the first miracle of the church was worked through who? Peter. Peter. Not a small thing. John was there. You know, I'm sure backing him up. Right? But Peter was just saying, you know, because what had Jesus told them? That they were now remembering with highlighters under it from, from after they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, Everything I do, you'll do, and greater works than these. Because when I go to heaven, God's going to send you the promise, which is the Holy Spirit, right? You'll do these things and more. And they also said, and by the way, they persecuted me, they will persecute you. They will drag you in before Sanhedrin's, which is going to happen, uh -huh. and courts, and kings. And he says, don't be afraid. The worst they can do is kill your body. Don't be afraid. All right? And don't even prepare what you're going to say. Don't fret it. Because when that time comes, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say that you're supposed to say. And you will, in this way, be my witnesses. Jerusalem, which is now Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world. Everyone came running towards them in great excitement to the portico of Solomon, as it is called, where the man was still clinging to Peter and John. When Peter saw the people, he addressed them. He said, good, a preaching opportunity. <laughs> He gives the same speech. Larry? I just want to make a comment just before you go into that section. That is, it's interesting that, you know, as we saw in the Gospels, every time somebody came into contact with Jesus, their lives changed for the better. Um, and in this case, this man comes into contact with Jesus through Peter. But what's interesting is where he goes to next. He goes to the church. Yeah, well, he's going to first have to go through the Sanhedrin because they're going to drag him in too. Yeah. <laughs> right. But let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Did the man expect to be healed? No. no. Did the man approach Peter in faith and say, Son of David, heal me? He was looking for money. Whose faith activated this miracle? Peter's. Was it Peter's magic? It's the 
Holy Spirit working. Do we not here have a, another rudimentary sacrament being Baptism. passed on? The sacrament of the sick. Yeah. Sacrament of the sick. The lead elders of the church will pray and they will recover. Okay? Another one. Not an invention of Pope blah blah, blah in, the, in the year 1000. This is Pope Peter. <laughs> Right? Just in 30 A.D. Lowered their friend down through the roof and Jesus said the faith of your friends. Faith of your friends. But here we have nobody but Peter. Peter's walking along and the Holy Spirit says, look to your right, buddy. And he says, he says you know what I want you to do? And he says, hmm, hadn't done this one before, Lord. He says, John, you got my back. I'm going in. Maybe that's what he said. That's <laughs> or my, if he'd been Jay, he said, well, let me pray it up for a couple of days. I'm going to come back and look at this again, right? Uh, uh, he just does it. Was there any doubt in his mind? I don't know. But I guess he thought, if it doesn't work, it's on Jesus, right? <clears throat> Jesus promised these things will happen. These signs will follow you. You will pray for the sick and they will recover. But Peter had seen Jesus do so. Seen Jesus do it. Now they had gone on their own missionary trips before, remember? And they had seen some miracles work. That was sort of a training mission. But now Jesus now Peter's gotta be thinking, this is the real game. We're not this is not a scrimmage anymore, right? This is it. John, you go long. You gave this to me, I gotta give it to someone. That's right, that's right. He understands this too is part of the church's ministry. All right. He says, men of Israel, why are you surprised at this? Why are you staring at us though, though we had made this man walk by our own power of holiness? He makes no claims to his own holiness. None at all. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our ancestors who has glorified his servant. Now they like that talk. This is your ancestors prophesied this and simply come true. Don't reject it. Accept it. This is great news. Jesus, whom you handed over and dis disowned in the presence of Pilate after you had given his verdict to release him. Remember, Pilate wanted to let him go. It was you who accused the holy and upright one. You who demanded that a murderer, Barabbas, should be released to you while you killed the prince of life. God, however, raised him from the dead, and to that fact we are witnesses. And it is the name of Jesus, which, through faith in him, has brought back the strength of this man, whom you see here, and who is well known to you. It is faith in him that has restored this man to health, as you can all see. Now I know, brothers, that neither you nor your leaders had any idea what you were really doing. This was the way God carried out what he had foretold. When he said through all his prophets, that is, Christ would suffer. Now you must repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and so that the Lord may send the time of comfort. He's just quoting right out of Isaiah here. Mm -hmm. Right out of it. And then he will send you the Christ he has predestined, that is, Jesus, whom heaven must keep till the universal restoration comes, which God proclaims, speaking through his holy prophets. Moses, for example, said, from among your brothers, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me. You will listen to whatever he tells you. Anyone who refuses to listen to that prophet shall be cut off from the people. In fact, all the prophets that have ever spoken from Samuel onwards has predicted these days. These days. I don't think he has a fully fleshed out understanding of these days. But he understands, as I said last week, they live in an existential drama. A peak moment in history where everything's going to change these days. He's talking about the universal restoration, which to them, when they looked at their prophecies, Isaiah and others, it said that when Messiah comes, he is going to restore the unified kingdom of David. Now, one of the problems they had is that for hundreds of years, 10 of the tribes have been lost. Remember? Israel and Judah separated. The ten tribes of Israel were conquered by the Syrians. They deported them to the rest of the world, refused to let them practice their religion. They intermarried, and their identity, their descendants, were, were lost to history. Nobody knows who they are. And yet all these prophecies say 
that one of the signs of the end time will be a restoration of a unified Israel. They didn't know who they were, but God does. Amen. Right. That's true. <laughs> but I think what, and Peter's proclaiming it, may thinking God somehow knows. Right? I think what they're going to come to an understanding of is that in fulfilling that part of the prophecy to Abraham, their ancestor, that from you will come a universal blessing for all the nations, that what will happen as all the nations and all the Gentiles are brought in by default, the Jews, are there too. the Jews, their descendants are there too. I told you before, if you had a teaspoon of medicine and you dissolved it in some water and you wanted to get every last drop of that medicine, what would you do? You drink the whole glass of water, right? So, were the Gentiles invited in order to fulfill this prophecy? No. Or were the prophecy going to be fulfilled by the universal invitation? So that everyone can accept or deny the invitation to belong to this unified, restored kingdom of David with his descendant Jesus Christ as the everlasting king or not. Now, Peter will come to understand that more explicitly. Because somehow, just believing in the prophets, somehow or another, by some mechanism, he believed that was going to happen in these days. In these days. And he's telling them, these days. He said, here he goes. You are the heirs of the prophets. The heirs of the covenant God made with your ancestors when he told Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed in your descendants. It was for you in the first place that God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you as every one of you turns from his wicked ways. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of their prophets and all the prophets had promised. And this one perhaps being the greatest. That not only will he restore Israel, not only will he bring peace and restitution between the people of God and their Lord, which they had rejected, but that it will be such a great blessing. The restitution will include the entire world. Not just healing the break between Israel and God, but the break between humanity and God. Going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, really. Alright, so that we're not just, we're, it's not just a rescue attempt for the broken covenant that God had with the Jewish people, but the broken covenant God had with Adam and Eve. Okay? In these days, Peter understands the epic value of his generation and the tremendous importance of his ministry and the church. But I don't think he fully understood the scope of it for a couple of decades later. That's when he realized, I don't need to be Bishop of Jerusalem. I need to get to Rome. Right? I need to get to Rome, the capital of the world. While they were still talking to the people, the priests came up to them accompanied by the captain of the temple and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the political party, you might say, of the Levites, of the priests. The Sadducees were all priests. The Pharisees were not. All right, so the Sanhedrin was made of Pharisees, Sadducees, and other elders, important people. But the, the Pharisees and Sadducees disagreed on some points of doctrine. We've seen that before, right? The Sadducees rejected the existence of angels, and they rejected the resurrection from the dead, which the Pharisees accepted both. So what is what has Peter just told the people? Jesus, whom you crucified, has been risen. risen. He's alive. He's out there talking resurrection stuff. They're, they're just saying, oh, you crazy. Right. While they were still talking to the people, the priests came up to them, accompanied by the captain of the temple. They brought the temple police and the Sadducees. And they were extremely annoyed that is teaching the people the resurrection from the dead yep. by proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. The heck with the healed man. <laughs> the heck with the, the, the whole town shaking at Pentecost. The heck with the, the miracle of the speaking of tongues and people understanding it. The heck with all the miracles. You're saying something I don't like. Don't mess up my brain with evidence. I have a firmly held opinion that I have no intention of changing. I don't like you. You must be wrong and I will never agree with you. Don't try to confuse me with proof. I got no time for that, right? <laughs> they arrested them. It was already late. All we knew was past 3 o'clock now. 6 o'clock is the end of the day. They couldn't have trial at night. 
So the trial was going to be in the morning. It was just the logistics of it. So they arrested him, threw him in jail till the next day. But many of those who had listened to their message became believers, and the total number of men had now risen to something like 5,000. So he's had the three. Others were added. Pick up, knock off another couple thousand today. So he sends them to the rest of the apostles, and I guess they're going to get busy baptizing all night while Peter and John and the, the man formerly lame are in prison. That's a lot of people. If you think if we about 5,000 in one place. Right, and I think that that's going to have some import as to why the Sanhedrin... Look, Jesus. why was Jesus crucified? What finally was the deal that just nailed it down for him? It's blasphemy. I mean, they're trying to nail all this stuff on him. They had false witnesses and nothing would really stick. Finally, they just asked him point blank, are you the son of God? And when he said yes, that's when the high priest ripped his cloak and said, we don't need more witnesses. This is blasphemy because it boiled down to either he's right or he's a liar. He's either a blasphemy or my God, this is the son of God in our midst. And despite all the evidence, all the miracles, everything else, they decided we cannot accept that. That's why he was executed. All right, well, when the apostles are here, they're having a hard time finding anything to stick, but they didn't just stand up and say, is Jesus the Son of God? They didn't. I wonder why. They would already figured out how to do it with Jesus. So here, they, I guess they thought, well, we killed Jesus, so that should be the end of it. And here we are two months later, and there's 5,000 of them. And these fishermen are actually, instead of running away and hiding, they're out here in the public every day preaching that Jesus has risen from the dead. And now they've healed somebody. This is really getting to be a problem. Right. So, but, but they didn't say, well, just tell me plainly then. Is Jesus the Son of God? But they didn't do it. I think the Holy Spirit shut their mouth. For one thing, if they had tried to crucify Peter and John, there's now 5,000 loyal followers in the neighborhood next to the temple. Jesus didn't have that. right? They might be thinking, this could be a problem. And we've already figured out killing the leader didn't help us. So if we kill off a couple of followers, they'll just replace them with 10,000. I mean, what are we going to do? We've got a problem here, boys. we got a problem. Now, here we are 2,000 years later. And I guess one of the commentaries that perhaps people say and give for reasons that they don't follow Jesus. Okay? Because how do I know what's happened? Right. How do I know he's real? How do I know what that book is, is real? Isn't that just a bunch of rules made by man? And it's events just like this that should stir you into faith to think that why would somebody want to be a follower when they knew Quite possibly they were going to die. Did I just not read you the list of the twelve apostles? <laughs> so this accusation, they just did it, it was just this was just a get rich quick scheme. Right. <laughs> they decided to fabricate the story about Jesus rising from the dead so they get a lot of notoriety and a lot of money. Did any of them get rich? Did any of them get notoriety? The only fame they had is uh, being crucified, I'm skinned to death or arrows or beheaded or stoned, maybe repeatedly before they finally killed me. If this was a get rich quick Ponzi scheme. It was the stupidest one I've ever heard of. They claimed we are witnesses to this and we believe it's truer than the value of our own life. So, as Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It was the apostles, the other disciples, and God knows how many other of these, these disciples were also executed, right? And then the generation that came out of them, and after them, and after them, and after them, until finally the Roman Empire got so sick on the blood of Christians that they began to wonder, why do they do this? I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't die for the emperor or for Zeus or whoever. I mean, either they're crazy or they really are onto something here, right? And, and so that's, that's exactly right. It's illogical to think this would be a fabricated, man-made ploy so that we can all get horribly tortured and killed. Makes sense to me. Yeah. And they, they never changed them. their story. They never changed their story. They gave them a, a, an out. Just deny God. Or they did. I mean, the early Christians, all they had to do is put a little incense in the, in the burning fire and say, Caesar is God. They said, you either do that or you're going to be executed. First, you're going to see all your children executed. Mm. Then you. 
fed to the animals or made a human torch or whatever it's going to do, the torture of the day. And, and the ones that didn't do it, they might have thought, this guy's crazy. Mm. You said in the beginning you wanted us to see the connections. may not be applicable, but you wanted us to see the connection with this activity going on and today. Now think about the young man with his little red hat standing up for what he believes through the church. I don't know the little boy's name. You talking about in the news this week? Yes. Oh, oh at the pro-life march? Still, I'm still standing up. How many 2019 years later? You know, I had a confirmation class on the Eucharist this week, and I found a little film talking about a number of people through the centuries who had done crazy things to rescue a consecrated host mm. to the point of being beaten to death before they would hand it over, little boys, or rushing into burning buildings to save the, the host in the, in the tabernacle, and all these kind of things. And it was very impressive to them on an emotional level. And I just wanted to get across, you know, the question of why would people do that? Why would people do that? And that because that's the big question. Why would you do that? And but it's the same kind of thing. It's the witness that is the most powerful thing because people can make all kinds of intellectual arguments against our intellectual arguments, right? But it's the witness. But it's the witness, the experiential evidence that's so important. Everything against the Catholic Church. I mean, it's like it's the new thing to pick up. Uh, I, I agree. I think I think I think there's Sanhedrin's popping up everywhere. Yeah. I really do. In in political thought, philosophical thought amongst the religions, the biggest thing is just the secular culture. So that religious people in general are considered throwbacks to a time we're trying to we're trying to get past, so we can live fully and freely in an enlightened era where religious superstition doesn't have a part anymore. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to be set free to join us, the liberated, educated, uh, modern people, and to leave that superstitious garbage behind. Will you do it? And we're all challenged by that in one way or another. What compromises will we make putting that pinch of incense in the fire? Or will we say, no, no. I, I just won't. Because most of us won't face death. But if you're here, you probably have people who think you're religious, not already. <laughs> There's that anyway. Uh, there are people who may not consider you smart or a good friend anymore because your political views being pro-life right at the top of it these days. Oh, yeah. well, I mean, they had to lock the doors in Washington. At the, uh, the, oh, yeah, the because that man and his group. I tried mean, to go just, during mass. They I mean, tried to invade really the just, church during mass. It's just becoming openly hostile, and the hostility against religion in general and Christianity specifically is uh, just becoming supported. But there's the, 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 against Jews and Catholics. I agree. Today. I agree. Ever before. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah, it is. I mean, I don't think we're setting the, the historical record, but it's certainly in our day and time moving in a wrong direction where it's not it's easy to see that it's not now nor in the future it will be even less automatically easy to be openly a Catholic or a Christian of any type mm -hmm. you might you might be you just might need to make the decision that if, if I make the sign of the cross and say grace in a public restaurant someone may come up and say you religious freak <laughs> I don't care I don't care good or you might even have somebody we've had this happen come up and say Thank you for doing that. Yeah. I haven't done that in public in 30 years. I didn't know there were people that still did. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I did. I don't so, I mean, that's such a small thing. Yeah. I mean, no one yet has come up and busted a beer bottle over my head. <laughs> well, if they do, they do, you know. I'd rather they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a restaurant, I'm probably all dressed up nice, going to go somewhere. I don't really want to have a broken head. And <laughs> but whatever. You're whatever. He guaranteed it. If they did this to me, they're going to do it to you. At some level. All right, let's move. Let's move on. Yes, sir. I, I hate to take up some time. Of, this has been bothering me since last night. So I want to. People are talking about these different things going on, and 
maybe I just maybe you don't know what the truth is or not. I don't know. Supposedly, a couple of young men called the governor of New York a baby murderer because he swore that New York State, irregardless of the rest of the country, will continue to have abortions through the ninth month. All right. Right. And the bishop or bishops, Catholic, jumped all over these two Catholic kids for doing that. I don't know if that's true or not. I would not want to be a bishop. Seriously disturbs me. Yeah, well, there'd be people calling uh, for the bishop to excommunicate Governor Cuomo over that. Um, Cardinal Dolan would be, be his jurisdiction, I guess, Archbishop of New York. I would not want to be in his shoes, but he's got a very hard decision to make. If he doesn't, what justification or what censor? Uh, because there's certainly grounds to do it in some circles, and others would say that would be counterproductive in the whole bit. I wouldn't want to be in his shoes. Um, I don't think it's, well, anyway. You can be extreme either way, and I'm not just trying to split the middle and be lukewarm, but uh, it's, it's a difficult position with political ramifications that could bring a lot of harm on the church, too. So I pray for him. Pray for bishops everywhere that have politicians like that. Um, you know, that's the, law, that's the law of the land. That's the law of the land. You, New York had never really updated their abortion law from pre-1973. He made a big deal of it and really did an in-your-face kind of thing. But basically what they said, we are now adhering the law of the land and intended to implement it without restrictions, where some states have put restrictions on it. Some, like Pennsylvania, never have. They've been able to do that forever. That's where the whole, uh, what's the movie of the, the guy that went to jail? God, no, that's where he was at. Um, so, I mean, it's a tough situation. I consider abortion rights to be the civil rights movement of our generation. I really do. Um, and I would like to think in the early 1800s I would have been an abolitionist. I don't know. I like to think I would have been. Mm -hmm. But for the same reasons. For the same reasons. Uh, and the arguments are the same, really, in my opinion. So, in our day and time, and I think we're going to win this one sooner or later. Uh, we do. I mean, because the, the reaction to that, I mean, he might have been a hero in Manhattan. The rest of the country is disgusted with that. So just to be so brazen, cold, and heartless towards pro-lifers and the sincere uh, love they have in their heart, to just put it in your face for political gain is pretty, pretty awful. Right, the, not just what he did, but how he did it. And, and and the young people, the young people in our country, and as science goes on to support what goes on in the preborn stages of life, I mean, they're just becoming to realize that abortion on demand is just wrong. It's just wrong. You don't have to be religious. My complaint with pro-life rallies, and they should tell you this. We've been to Atlanta a few times. Is that they just make it too religious. I mean, the people that get up and speak are all Southern Baptists, and maybe the Bishop of Atlanta. But you know, to me, it's a human rights issue. And I, 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 there are, I, what should be invited, there are Jews for life, atheists for life, feminists for life, Muslims for life. They should all be invited into the camp. They shouldn't make it, we have this opinion because this is what our scriptures and our tradition tell us. No. There should be a public morality about humanity and moral rights to life and that I don't have the right to impose my will on you when it comes to such a fundamental God-given right. And that God-given right, just like it says in the preamble and in our Constitution, should be codified by law in a just and a good society. We haven't done it yet. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. <clears throat> and this is where some of us uh, who, who do not belong to the majority race have conflict. Um, I don't like abortion at all. Just as you were saying, one, as we're talking about abortion, uh, we should also talk about the behavior of these so-called Southern Evangelicals and Southern Baptists. Because some of us see their behavior as being very racist. Now, if you're going to talk about one thing, you need to integrate the rest of it. Because some of us who are adults want to live too. Right. So while they're talking about abortion, they should also talk about how we can have a fair society. I, I agree. That, that, that theology and understanding is called the seamless garment theory. That it's not a single issue thing. The idea, the idea of respecting life 
from conception to natural death. Should include civil rights, it should include death penalty, it should include a lot of other things in there. Have a consistent ethic, uh, which is my argument has been, I know people that are very pro-life in certain areas that somehow have a blind spot when it comes to the unborn. And I just say, you're just not being consistent. You need to have a, you need, you have a train wreck in your own thinking that you need to straighten out first and tell me how you can have those two competing views and hold them both as consistent because my opinion or not we're, we're getting way astray here and it's all being videotaped here. right and then the big question who's my neighbor so right now we're trying to decide at one time we had to decide women are my neighbors black people are my neighbors children are my neighbors and now we have to decide are the unborn human beings in our society my neighbors, right? Yeah. So I know. Yeah. Train wreck, boom, right there in my cerebral cortex. Absolutely. I agree. It's just Actually, we're not deviating too far from it because we are devoting ourselves to the teachings of the apostles. And when we talk about life, we're devoting ourselves to that teaching. So perhaps that's something we should consider in the future for some of our Bible studies is maybe take current events and apply them to what the church teaches and what we understand and know is the truth. That's future. Okay. Well, it seems to be happening already here. We do it all. Right. All right. So, so yes, standing up for what we believe God wants to be the will of God in our society, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, as it says in one place in the scripture, is part of our vocation. And we need to pray for the courage and the wisdom and the love to be able to, to do that credibly, forcefully, but never out of hate. Never out of hate. You won't get anywhere. Okay? I'll just stop there. All right. All right. So where are we? I'm in chap. Am I up to four now? Okay. Right. These days. These days the prophets spoke about, from Samuel onwards, you're living in them. The days where the, the, the promises of God will be complete and the heirs of the covenant, which you are, will see and receive all that God said would happen. In these days, we are the swing generation that's seeing the completion of that era and the dawn of the kingdom of God, the restored Israel, the everlasting kingdom of the descendant of David that he said would come all along. It is the church. Chapter 4, while they were still talking to the people, the I already did that, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so they got 5,000. The next day, by what power and by whose name have you men done this? Great question. Peter said, thank you for that. That's just a softball pitch. Let me just knock this out of the park right now. By what power and by whose name have you men done this? <laughs> Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, addressed them and said, rulers of the people and elders... If you are questioning us today about an act of kindness to a cripple and asking us how he was healed, you must know, all of you and the whole people of Israel, that it is by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified and God raised from the dead by this name. By no other has this man, does this man stand before you cured. This is the stone which you, the builders, rejected, but which has become the cornerstone. Remember, Jesus said, I am the stone that will either crush you or become the cornerstone of your life. It's your choice. Your choice. Only in Him is there salvation. For all the names in the world given to men, this is the only one by which we can be saved. They were astonished at the fearlessness shown by Peter and John. These uneducated fishermen from the outback of Galilee. Give me a break. <laughs> Considering that they were uneducated laymen. Laymen. Lay trash. And they recognized them as associates of Jesus. But when they saw the man who had been cured standing by their side, they could find no answer. What do we do with that? Hmm. So, they did nothing. They ordered them to stand outside while the Sanhedrin had a private discussion. What are we going to do with these people, they asked. It is obvious to everyone in Jerusalem that a notable miracle has been worked through them, and we cannot deny it. But to stop the whole thing spreading any further among the people, let us threaten them. 
against ever speaking to anyone in this name again. I'd like to point out to you that Peter and John were not there when they had that conversation. How does Luke know it happened? Joseph of Arimathea? Gamaliel possibly? We know that some members of the Pharisee party, perhaps some member of the Sanhedrin, eventually converted. Okay. There was a leak. That was a leak. <laughs> a leak in the administration. Huh? Remember when Luke is writing this at the beginning when he's speaking to Theophilus in, in, in the Gospel of Luke, he says, after much research ah. and, uh, and understanding, he did a lot of research in writing the Gospel and Acts. Right. Yeah. So he might have said, you know, Peter and John, they went in there. I wonder what went on when they were out that they decided to make that decision. So we go, she's after Joseph Arimathea, he's in Ephesus. <laughs> oh, okay. Joseph, what happened? So basically, what we're going to do, the healed man is standing right there, right? Uh, we've got about two minutes. So they called them in and gave them a warning on no account to make statements or to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John retorted. Now Jesus had told them, these leaders hold their office by God's design. Do what they tell you. Just don't do as they do. But there's a limit. And this is also instructive for us. We are to be good citizens, except when we're told to do something that's in opposition to the will of God and we know it. He says, you must judge whether in God's eyes it is right to listen to you and not to God. We cannot stop proclaiming what we have seen and heard. The court repeated the threats <laughs> and then released them. They could not think of any way to punish them since all the people were giving glory to God for what had happened. The man who had been miraculously cured was over 40 years old. So there, all the people are going to see this man miraculously cured and next thing they're going to see is Peter and John being drug out and crucified? No. Probably not going to work. Now, probably not the most politically intelligent thing to do. So they were stuck and they knew it. They say, oh yeah, well, just stop it anyway. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do it. Don't tell me you're going to. I'm telling you once again. That'll teach you. Don't do it. Let them go. As soon as they were released, they went to the community and told them, listen to this, everything the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they had heard it, they lifted their voice to God with one heart and said, Master, they prayed, it is you who made sky and earth and sea, everything in them. It is you who said through the Holy Spirit and speaking through our ancestor David, your servant, why this uproar among the nations? This impotent muttering of the peoples. Kings on earth take up position. Princes plot together against the Lord and his anointed. This is what has come true. In this very city, Herod and Pontius Pilate plotted together with the Gentile nations, the Romans, and the people of Israel, at least the leaders, against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, to bring about the very thing that you and your strength and your wisdom had predetermined should happen. And now look, take note of their threats and help your servants to proclaim your message with all fearlessness by stretching out your hand to heal and to work miracles and marvels through the name of your holy servant Jesus. As they prayed, the house they were assembled in rocked. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is shaking the whole city up on a regular basis now, isn't it? They had another little Pentecost, an aftershock, right? As they prayed, the house they were assembled in rocked. And from this time, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, a new, a fresh outpouring, a fresh anointing, right? They'd gone to another level. They'd seen a miracle work. And now they're praying, Lord, pour out your miracles, because that seems to shut the mouth of our opponents. It shuts their mouth. They don't know what to do with this. Pour it out, Lord. Let there be more. They might forget about this man, but give us hundreds more. But everywhere you go, more evidence of the truth that you've given your church be made known in ways people can tangibly see. Mm. And he did. And he did. <laughs> so that we can pro proclaim the word of God fearlessly. Okay, we'll leave on that happy note before we get to Annas and, Ka and uh, <laughs> Sapphira. And we'll end right there in the middle of chapter 4, okay? Yeah, I need about a few of our strong men to help me get some chairs back. Okay. Strong men? A few strong men.
<laughs> Look, I know a lot of you are strong. Maybe for short periods of time. That's what I tell my sons. I'm still stronger than ox, but for very short periods of time. All right, let's end. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen.